but I want our guest to introduce herself. And um, I'm going to ask you to do that by answering a question, which is how sort of two questions. How did you get into this world? And did you find that of podcasting? And did you find that it was uh, a happy accident? And tell us a bit <laughs> about yourself and how this how your journey led to this. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here today. I am so excited to talk with you today, Jonathan, and with all the folks out there. Thank you. Um, and as far as how I got into podcasting, I have to be perfectly frank with you. When I got into it, I didn't even know what a podcast was. I was working at New York Public Radio. I was working on a live daily news show. It was a pretty new show. It was called The Takeaway. And they were trying to reach a younger, more diverse audience. And um, uh, part of that was having interactions on social media with listeners. They had a Twitter feed. They had a Facebook feed. This was about 15 years ago. They Whatever social media was out there at the time, they tried to interact with all of the listeners on, you know, on those different types of social. And uh, mm -hmm. part of also trying to reach a younger, more diverse audience was they were open to the idea of different staff members breaking off and doing little projects here and there. And the film critic on The Takeaway, he actually uh, is a film critic for Newsday, but he was a contributor to The Takeaway. And I produced all of his segments. His name is Rafer Guzman. And Rafer Guzman and I had a great rapport. And he said to me at one point, hey, what do you think about us pitching a movie podcast to the higher ups at The Takeaway? And so we did. And we made a podcast that was me producing, Rafer hosting, and the higher-ups took a listen and they said, mm, it's fine, but we hear Kristen, you and Rafer, arguing with each other every week on the phone as you're preparing his weekly segment. We hear that you have a lot of strong opinions about movies. Why don't you appear on this podcast with Rafer? Why don't you both produce and host it? And um, I said, sure. And before you knew it, I was hosting and producing a weekly movie podcast that ran for over six years through New York Public Radio and also being thrown on air every week to talk about pop culture. So I became a regular on-air personality and I had never set out to do that in my life. So wow. uh, I was really dragged into it. And at the time I had never once listened to a podcast. When I started podcasting, I had never listened to one. I didn't know how they worked. I did not know what an RSS feed was. I didn't know anything at all. And now what is it, 15 years later? And I have hosted, I think, a dozen podcasts for brands like Slate, the New York Times, um, right. Newsweek, uh, Audible, Stitcher. So I've hosted so many podcasts now I and, and I just love it. And I feel very lucky that Rafer kind of dragged me into this and that uh, I, I had people believe in me because I don't know if I would be doing this if it weren't for other people's ideas first. Okay. Well, very, uh, who knows? We'll never know, but uh, okay. So you, you would definitely fall in more the category of the happy accidents. Things just sort of led you along here. So our audience, um, you know, there are all different types of folks that are in the, the Hindenburg audience. Some people have been doing this forever. Some people are journalists. Um, some people's industry has changed a bit. Uh, some folks, but many folks are just getting this who have never seen or heard of this. So I'm going to try to address folks in different kind of, uh, I don't know, places on their journey there with that. Okay. Um, and so one of the things that you just mentioned, so um, for folks who don't know, the, uh, it'd be too long to list the things that you are involved in. I would suggest going to Kristen's uh, pod chaser page to get an idea of that. It's a lot. Um, but you ha uh, have hosted many, many podcasts. You have, you know, at least four, of course, you know, by the book, uh, when Megan met Sally, it's that on and on and on. But in some things, as you just mentioned, you're a, uh, you're a producer and you just, you just talked a bit about that for those folks who don't know, um, what do you mean by that? What does what does that actually entail? And um, uh, how would people, I guess, get into that? Um, well, you don't have to answer that if, if you don't know. <laughs> That's fine. But yeah, just talk a little bit about um, how, you know, being a producer and then which do you like more? Which role do you like more? Oh, gosh. Well, producing, I highly recommend that anybody who has dreamed of hosting a podcast also learn how to produce because 
producing will make you a better host. Hosting will make you a better producer. And um, as far as what a producer does, the list is so long and varied. It really depends on what kind of project you're working on. It, in my case, has included everything from guest booking, you know, deciding what kind of guest would be the best to help tell the story, uh, the best person who can shine a light on an issue, who's being affected by a certain issue and so on. So uh, booking guests, including in my case, one of my specialties has always been booking celebrity guests. I have booked people um, who you've probably heard of, Taylor Swift, Betty White, Dolly Parton. I've booked a lot of famous people to be on shows. Um, so and will you give out Taylor Swift's contact information at the end of this? <laughs> we'll, we'll just put that in the chat later okay, so yeah, yeah. It'll be in the uh, chat folks <laughs> yes yes so i i have you know done a lot of guest booking but then on top of that you know also script writing and script writing isn't necessarily word for word everything you're going to say in a show sometimes it is oftentimes it's just a list of questions an intro and an outro and so on um mm -hmm. It's all the logistics behind the scenes. It's corresponding with people, with their publicists and so on. It's thanking them. It's sending them, this is the link to this. This is the location of this. It's a lot of, you know, calendar management and so on. Uh, producing is also... Uh, oftentimes being the person who cuts together all the sound. It's the person who hits the record button. It's the person who has the countdown clock and is saying, you only have three minutes left to finish recording this until our guest has to be on their next interview. And so it's a lot of those kinds of things. And then also um, the logistics of actually putting the podcast out into the world. So oftentimes if you're a producer, you're the one who is making sure that RSS feed is up, that the podcast is, you know, posted to Libsyn or wherever it is, that it's being distributed. You may be the person who in the case of independent shows, you may be the person who is coordinating ad sales or working with a small ad sales company that's helping to, you know, monetize your show. You may be the person who is promoting the show. I believe that whether it's an indie show or a network show or anything else, uh, you should be promoting your show as a producer, as a host, as both of them. Your job is not just to make the content, but to help people discover it. And part of that is promoting it also. So it's doing a lot of different things. Um, mm. In some cases, I even know producers who compose their own music. So I don't do that. But um, as a producer, you may have to source music. There are a lot of free music libraries or low-cost music libraries out there. So um, the, the job... It, it can entail a lot of different things. In some cases, it's just a list of three things that a host will have you just cut it together and send it back to them and, you know, fact check it, fact check it. So it really varies. So, and, and as you said, um, uh, if you want to get better at being on air, learn about producing. So like, if you want to get better at speaking, get better at writing and those work uh, in, in tangent with each other. Um, and that, that makes a lot of sense. We, we hear that, uh, over and over again, actually. Uh, so with that, I mean, it's, it, um, it's a great answer, especially for folks who are again, getting into this industry or are curious about it. So what have you heard from new podcasters when they come up to you at a conference or other, other places about mistakes that they've made? And, and can you talk a little bit about, uh, a mistake that maybe you made when, how about getting into like the independent podcasts and such? that you wish you knew what you knew now then? Oh, yeah. I, I have made so many mistakes. I've made logistical mistakes where I thought I hit the record button and I did not hit the record button. I've made the mistake where I'm cutting together all my audio, but I'm not saving it every few minutes. And we should all be saving every few minutes because unfortunately technology crashes sometimes. Sometimes our computers crash. Sometimes our network connection crashes, whatever it is. And so I've made that mistake of being about 90% of the way through a four hour edit. And then suddenly things crash and things are not saved. Um, I have made the mistake of putting audio out into the world and saying, here's my episode for the week. And because I didn't give it a second listen through, there were a couple of things I missed that I left in that I should have cut out. And that can be very embarrassing. Or I accidentally had one track muted and then I you know, bounced that audio and put it out in the world. And I thought, oh my God, I can't believe I put that out there. And I had that track muted because I was just working on editing the final part of that one track up there. And oh my gosh. So I've made all of those technical mistakes. But then also I've made mistakes um, 
with some of my indie shows. I, I do mostly network shows, but I have hosted a couple of indie shows where I'm in charge of the show Soup to Nuts. And one mistake that I think a lot of indie people make is if they want to monetize their show and if you know they're thinking about ad sales, I think a lot of indie people just think, I want a big brand name company to sell my ads for me. And I would say, no, go for a company that's small, that's scrappy, people who are young and hungry. And by young, I don't mean age-wise, but people who are not necessarily in the industry for 20 years, but people who are out there working with smaller shows, people who specialize in you know, independent shows. Uh, don't necessarily try to go to a big name company to do your ad sales for you. They don't necessarily know how to sell ads for small shows. I made that mistake. Um, another mistake that I made with my independent shows is I wasn't necessarily promoting them the right way. I was inviting a lot of big name guests onto my shows, but I wasn't actually necessarily pitching myself as often as I should have as a guest onto other shows with big audiences. And both of those things need to happen if you want to grow your show. Um, it's, it's you know, th there are the rare indie shows that just from the get-go take off and get a huge audience on their own without a lot of promotion. But most shows need to be promoted. Most shows, you need to go out there and get the word out on your show. So uh, especially with independent shows. With a network, they'll frequently cross-promote your shows across all the other shows in their portfolio. But with an indie show, you really need to do that. And you need to figure out the best way to do that for your show. That's great advice. If you want your show to get more attention, be a guest on other shows. That makes a, a lot of sense. Um, you, you have, a, you know, great advice here. And you've written a book on this very thing, right? So I have two questions with this, okay? One is just, why did you write the book? What made you want to do that? And the book, by the way, is uh, So You Want to Start a Podcast. Um, and you also narrated the audiobook. is that correct? That so is my, correct, yeah. That is correct. So uh, I'm kind of more in the, or in the audiobook world a fair amount, and uh, it's a different thing. And some of our folks are kind of curious about going from one to the other. So can you tell us a little bit about what was different in that process for you too? So um, reading an audiobook versus um, uh, hosting my podcast, you mean? Yes, the rec the actual recording of it. What was different? What didn't you expect? <laughs> well, recording my audiobook was such a trip because even though I wrote all the words uh, of my book and everything was in my own voice, I I wrote the whole thing in about a month and just plowed it out, just put it out in the world, and it was completely me. My editor only edited, I think, one sentence in the entire book before she greenlit it and put it to press. And so it's not like I had to read anybody else's words other than my own. And yet when I sat down to record it, my instinct as a podcaster is oftentimes to improv a little bit. And the producer, because HarperCollins, which publishes uh, which publishes both my books, they um, they hired a producer for my audiobook, and the producer had to pop in a couple of times and say, Kristen, remember, you have to read the words exactly and precisely as they are on the page. You cannot change a single word here. So that was the biggest difference for me is you cannot change a single word. Um, the other thing that really stood out to me was that I was alone in a room reading off of a page with um, just, uh, I, I guess it was an iPad or it was some sort of tablet where it was a never ending scroll. My book was set up so there would never be a click, there would never be a turn page. It was just my finger constantly moving the page up and right. never stopping. And there's something about that that can feel a little bit exhausting. When you're recording a podcast, you know, you know that it's like, I'm going to record for half an hour or I'm going to record for 90 minutes or however long it is, and then it's done. But there's something about just seeing a never ending feed of words <laughs> that can be a little bit exhausting, I have to say. Yeah. I mean, typically when folks get into the audiobook world, the first thing that they uh, encounter is is that it's, it's just hard, it's just longer. So it's just harder by its nature. You know, it's just a different animal. And they maybe weren't expecting that. So that's all. It doesn't mean it's a bad animal. It just has to expect it's like a different, different situation. Absolutely. And and yeah. I will say it does involve a tiny bit of performance. I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks at this point. I kind of wish I had listened to more audiobooks before I recorded my own. Mm. Um, 
the best audiobooks I've listened to are like Viola Davis narrating her own memoir. And I think, oh, you know why she's good at that? Because she's performing her book. She's not just reading it to me. And right. so I, I would suggest anybody who wants to enter the audiobook narration world, listen to a hundred audiobooks first. <laughs> listen <laughs> and decide what do you like that these narrators are doing? How can I do the job better? I mean, Honestly, I, I am a lesson in mistakes here. Before I started podcasting, I should have listened to podcasts. Before I narrated audiobooks, I should have listened to audiobooks. <laughs> Please, listeners, viewers, do better than I did. Well, I'll, I'm you've been you're doing fine. Uh, you you did great, and you continue to do great. One thing I know you didn't make a mistake on was is of course the uh, the DAW that you use, which is which is Hindenburg. So just just um, for everybody out there listening. We always want to bring these, uh, bring different guests as part of the series, just to kind of talk about the industry, different things maybe we're all not aware of. Sometimes it's technical stuff. Sometimes it's behind the scenes of the business part. Um, in, in this case, uh, and we so we don't want to do it too much to talk about Hindenburg, but of course, we think it's great. We're pretty biased here, but you are a Hindenburg user, um, yes. And you know, you talk about it in the book and and all of that. So. Um, uh, when did you uh, start using Hindenburg and what do you think is the main difference with like your workflow before and after? Yeah, well, what I really like about Hindenburg is it's simple. And I think a lot of podcasters, especially when they're starting out, uh, get very, very sidelined, um, either intimidated or distracted by the idea of, I must have something with every bell and whistle. I must have something that's more expensive than everything else. If my microphone is not $1,000, it's probably not the best microphone. If my editing software isn't $2,000, I shouldn't be using it. And Hindenburg, that's not the case. Hindenburg, I, I just think that, you know, why make things harder for yourself? Why make things expensive for yourself when they don't need to be? And so that's why I chose Hindenburg. I wanted it to be simple. I wanted it to be easy. And frankly, I'm a cheapo. I don't want to spend thousands of dollars on my editing software. I just don't want to do that. And so I chose Hindenburg. And Hindenburg, I can save certain templates on there. And then just, you know, for example, my podcast, Movie Therapy with Rafer and Kristen, um, that one always had the same intro and the same bump music and the same outro music. And I could just, you know, pull up my template drop in this week's recordings of the audio tracks of me and Rafer, drop in the clips of the movies that we were putting in into a template that I just had saved there. And it was super easy to do. And what did I have? Four tracks at a time that I was working with. Movie clip tracks, music tracks, me and Rafer. That was it. I don't need 75 tracks at the same time. I just need something simple, something easy. And also I wanted to make sure that Anything that I had, that there were certain plugins that were easy to, you know, update. So, for example, noise reduction is something that you can just get a really cheap, easy plugin from Hindenburg for. And I live in Brooklyn, and sometimes you need some noise reduction put on, you know, especially Rafer. <laughs> he he had a very noisy apartment at the time when we were hosting the show. It, we just sunsetted it last year, but, um, you know, it it should be simple. And I really want to reiterate, don't make things harder for yourself. Don't make things more expensive for yourself. Whether it's editing software or your microphone or whatever it is, it doesn't have to be expensive. I am literally standing in a closet right now with some secondhand foam padding on the walls, all secondhand studio equipment. Um, my husband bought all of this for me as a Christmas present several years ago, long before the pandemic. And because he wanted me to be able to have a studio at home so I didn't have to constantly run to other studios to record. And he confessed to me later, he's like, for your entire studio setup, the setup that you've used for the New York Times, for Slate, for Audible, for Stitcher, for this complete setup, I spent $150. That's what he told me. And I, I've made shows for the most premier brands in the world on you know, something that costs maybe a third of what other people are spending on a microphone. It can be done. I think that that is welcome news to a lot of people, unless they like getting into the gear part of it. Um, for a lot of folks that are concerned about uh, maybe the economics of doing a podcast, maybe it's a lot of work up front and those other things are a bit daunting. That's, that's a, a, a very nice thing to hear. Um, on that. So, so some people who maybe if you have a show out already and you're thinking about how you can get more eyeballs on it, Charity gets a great, um, 
uh, advice on getting on other people's podcasts, but a lot of folks are focusing on the video as a component for the, just increasing their brand uh, recognition. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think that, because that it seems like, well, then you have another element to focus on. Do you think that that's the right thing for people to do? I think it's the right thing for some people to do. And I've been a guest on, oh my gosh, dozens and dozens of podcasts that have a video component as well. And uh, depending on what your market is, sometimes that's going to be very useful for you. That's not necessary for every show though. So I just want to make clear, like you're not required to do that. In some markets, it's very valuable. Uh, for example, in Mexico, I believe most people, over 50% of people consume podcasts on YouTube. So in some parts of the world, it's a very useful thing to have that presence, that video presence. But in other parts of the world, that's not the case. So I would say get to know your market, get to know your listenership, and get to know, you know, based on what your particular topic is. Every topic is different. So if you're hosting a fitness podcast, maybe that's a really good case for having a video podcast because maybe you're going to actually be physically demonstrating certain, you know, physical moves that you're going to be doing. If you're doing an art podcast, that may be useful. I don't think it's necessary for all of them, but you know, it doesn't hurt to have some education in all the different kinds of media out there, but don't make things harder for yourself if you don't have to either. Right. Okay. Great. Great advice. That makes sense. Um, so do you think that there are too many podcasts in the world? Is, oh my are we gosh. oversaturated? <laughs> <laughs> I get asked this all the time, and I love this question. Um, the first time I got asked this question was many years ago. I was asked, oh, there are over half a million podcasts in the world. Aren't there too many now? And nowadays, there are well over 2 million podcasts in the world. But that's not too many. No, there are 360 million people in the U.S. and, you know, over a billion people on the planet. Who cares if there are 2 million podcasts out there? That, that to me is like asking, are there too many pencils and paper out there? Are there too many, you know, people who have access to ways to tell their story? I believe everybody has the right to tell their own story, to talk about um, what's important to them, to have their voice in the world. And it shouldn't just belong to a few elite people. It, uh, the ability to tell your story should not just belong to people who have money or who have endless amounts of leisure time. It should belong to everybody. If you want to 10 minutes a week, record a podcast on your iPhone and then release that into the world because that's all you have time for. That's all you have money for. Why should I be offended by that? I, I, I want everyone to have their stories out there. The more voices that are out there, the better. We should not have our culture, our history, and so on dominated only by a few voices. So get your story out there. I believe there's room for all of us in the pool. Well, okay. So on that, what would you like to see change in the industry in terms of advertising revenue and how the, the, the business part of it works in the future? So you're, you know, you're an advocate of more is better, get more podcasts out there. What on that side of things, what do you think people don't know about and what would you like to see change? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, the industry is constantly changing and I feel like we're in a big moment of change right now. And part of that change is to get back to what I was saying earlier, the big networks versus the indies. And I think a lot of the big networks now are realizing, you know, they need to contract a little bit that maybe they were investing too much money in celebrities, for example, a number of giant networks just thought, you know, if I hire a famous person, we'll make our money back overnight. So I'm going to pay so-and-so a million dollars and so-and-so a million dollars and so-and-so a million dollars and they'll all have podcasts. Well, it turns out not every celebrity necessarily hosts a good podcast. Not every celebrity <laughs> brings millions of dollars worth of listeners with them when they host a podcast either. Um, not everybody wants to hear their favorite celebrity um just talk into a microphone. Maybe we prefer to watch them in an action movie or on a comedy, you know? And so I think that there've been um, some realizations within those big networks of maybe we threw too much money in the wrong direction. And so there are changes happening there. And then um, on the flip side, there are more and more indie shows that are doing great without networks. If you think about shows like You're Wrong About and um, Maintenance Phase, for example, or Normal Gossip, these are shows that are, you know, not with giant networks, but have enormous followings. They're shows that have found ways to reach their audiences that um, 
is partly through really great content, partly through social media, um, and partly through, uh, you know, just talking to their listeners in a certain way where there's low pressure. Like, if you want to give us some money on Patreon, that's great. If you don't, we totally understand, you know. Uh, but they're looking at other revenue streams and not doing it the tra traditional way through the networks. And they're doing great. So I think now is a great time to be an indie podcaster. Now is a great time to look at those other indie shows and see what they're doing. And, you know, maybe take a few tips from them. Great advice. So listen to some of those shows. Um, okay. So, but on that, you had said, um, you know, in, in looking to the future and such, you've had a, uh, a, a tech podcast innovation uncovered, um, which is, it's, that's really interesting as it seems maybe a little different than some of your other, uh, uh, ventures. Um, so, I mean, you know, very, very diverse. Uh, how do you think, um, AI will play into all of that in, in the industry, uh, moving forward? Ah, uh, well, I, I will just say this first and foremost. I think technology and culture, um, they do intersect. Technology is not just, you know, a, a list of numbers and letters on a screen. Technology is not just, you know, robots that don't affect human life. Technology is uh, playing out the things that we think are important in life. Technology subverts certain things. Technology makes our lives better. Sometimes it makes our lives worse. But you know, what we're doing right now, talking to each other right now, Jonathan, this is being facilitated by technology. So I do it think is. technology and culture don't live separately from each other. And that's why I hosted a technology show, because I think that technology and culture are so intertwined. But right. as far as how AI affects all of this, I mean, I think it, it can do great things. Um, for example, thanks to AI, there are certain transcription services that are out there right now. There are certain tools that are available to make editing easier. And I think those are great things. I, I'm not afraid of AI, but um, I, I do think we also have to just be mindful of when AI does certain things that maybe make the world, you know, that I, AI makes mistakes sometimes because humans make mistakes. If humans are teaching AI, for example, to only choose the quote unquote best resumes in the pile, but we have taught the AI that the only resumes in the pile that are important are those that are coming from people who went to Ivy League schools, then that's our problem. We taught the AI incorrectly. So um, while AI can be a problem, I would say that we have to be mindful of how we're making AI the problem. What have we done to teach it wrong? Right. So you want some type of... Um sensible guidance to it. And, uh, I think it sounds like that echoes your, um, your thoughts on, um, you, you are an advocate of free speech, but you also like some amount of content moderation in hosting sites like Spotify or other places as it pertains to, um, misinformation or other things like that. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've been very transparent about that in all of my podcasts. I'm a big believer in free speech. We should be able to talk about our opinions. We should be able to talk about politics, religion, our lives. We should be able to talk about how, you know, what what our family looks like or what our families, you know, uh, you know, the families that we come from and so on. Uh, we should be able to talk about our values. And we all have different opinions in those areas. And that's totally fine. I don't need my life to look just like yours or yours or yours. And I don't need somebody else's life to necessarily reflect mine, you know, back at me. That's fine. It, life is so much more interesting because we're different. How boring would it be if we were the same? But I do think that there is such a thing as hate speech and inciting violence. And these are things that I'm not okay with. I'm not okay with inciting violence and hatred. And also, I think we need to be really, really careful about spreading scientific misinformation and presenting it as if it is fact. And there are some things that are irrefutable. For example, climate change is real. And this is something that is acknowledged by the military. If you look at the maps they have, they have flood maps for a reason because climate change is real. Insurance companies, big corporations that pay for um, housing developments and so on, they take climate change very, very seriously. And if giant corporations, the U.S. military, military and governments all over the world, plus scientists, are all taking climate change so seriously, uh, if you are spreading uh, false information, lies, 
mistruths about basic science that is accepted all over the world, then I, I think that's dangerous, not just in terms of climate change, but also in terms of things like, you know, vaccines. Uh, you know, there are definitely people out there who believe that the COVID-19 vaccines are inserting microchips in us or whatever, you know, all, all of these nonsense stories, I think, can be very dangerous. So I, I would say if it's scientific misinformation that's dangerous, if it is hatred or violence that's being incited, these are things that I'm not okay with. Again, difference of opinion, that's fine. But things that are dangerous, let's let's be mindful of those. Know where your microchips come from. Know where they've been sourced. <laughs> okay. Uh, so do you have any guilty pleasure podcasts? Things that, uh, or what's a, what's a show that you've been maybe addicted to? Oh my gosh. I, I, I would say almost everything I listen to is delicious. I don't listen to a lot of high-minded podcasts. I'll just be real okay. with you. Um, and uh, one, one that I find really delicious is called Cancelled for a Mamma Mia podcast in Australia. And the hosts look at people who have been publicly canceled and talk about, you know, or people who maybe they think uh, deserve some scrutiny and they look closely at it. D does this person deserve it? Does Meghan Markle deserve to be canceled because she touched her baby bump a lot when she was pregnant? Does she deserve to be canceled <laughs> because she, you know, wore this kind of shoe or hat at this event? Um, is the call to cancel Meghan Markle really just because she is American, divorced, and Black? And so they look at it that way, but they also look at other people who maybe uh, deserve all of the public vitriol. Like, here is somebody who committed sex crimes. Here is somebody who actually stole money from elderly people and lied about it, you know? And so- That sounds like it could be high-minded. I mean, it's, it's it, it <laughs> is in some ways, but it's also such a great deal of fun. I mean, I, I guess I'm a big believer that the best kinds of shows speak to important truths, but yeah. are delicious. I, I always say it's like broccoli <laughs> that is embedded in a pan of mac and cheese. Like, okay. I, I, I want to shovel that mac and cheese in my mouth, and I may not even realize that what I'm getting along the way are really great insights into our values and, um, and what it means to be human, what it means to do better in this world and so on. So yeah, canceled is just one example of a show I've been listening to a lot lately that does that. Okay. Pro mac and cheese and canceled. Got it. <laughs> okay. I think that's going to do it for us. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for everybody that's uh, been watching. They got a lot of just really great information and um, you've, I think you've helped a lot of folks out there. So we cannot thank you enough uh, for being a guest. We'd love to have you back in the future. Oh, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. All right. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you all out there. Uh, you can watch the replay in our Facebook uh, community feed. And, uh, and we'll see you down the road, everybody. Bye.